Uganda's High Commissioner to Kenya and the Seychelles, His Excellency Dr. Hassan Waswagaliwango. He is in the Situation Room. Karibu sana, Balozi. Asante. It's good to have you on the show. This is called the Situation Room and that is called the Hot Seat. But, you know, you are an ambassador of a friendly country, so we extend <laughs> the courtesies of friendliness to You're you. You're welcome. Yes. Um, ambassador, <coughs> Kenya and Uganda are one. That's what the, the, the our leaders tell us and our people tell us. We are one, but we are two distinct countries, and Uganda is celebrating its, uh, how many years of independence? 59. 59 years of independence, and the independence uh, ceremony will be tomorrow. Now, as you look at that, you, as the, as the person who's been sent by your country to come and represent your country's interest in Kenya, there are very many things that, you know, we'll be looking at in terms of our relations and uganda's place in the community of nations in east africa in africa and the world but let's just start with first of all congratulating the people of uganda and yourself on the occasion of celebrating your independence in kenya we call it madaraka what do you call it in uganda what's the name of the day there isn't a single word like madaraka for independence mm. different tribes can describe it differently but uh, in the most popular language in uganda which is Luganda, it is orunaku ramefuka the day of independence mm. orunaku is the day mm -hmm. ramefuka independence orunaku ramefuka mm. okay so that's the basically the 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 title of the holiday yep and and uh, a lot of celebrations of course that are geared to take place uh, even despite covid looking back at a country's independence is big now your work as an ambassador in kenya uh, how long have you been on this tour of duty in this country relatively short because uh, I officially reported for duty on 15th February 2021. Hmm. I'm struggling to make a year. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm already comfortable and I feel like I've been here for many more years mm -hmm. because I found the brothers and sisters. So there was no struggle in fitting in. Mm. I have uh, fitted in so easily and I'm comfortable and I found already a very good bilateral relation between Uganda and Kenya. Mm. So I found life easy for me to settle in and I'm happy doing my work. Yeah. So in the region, um, obviously, when we're looking at uh, how different countries play out, playing with own state sovereignty and also, you know, looking at cooperation, what roles do you feel that Uganda has played while still trying to develop its own nationalism, but then also being part of this very important community? What role has Uganda played over the years and the impact? Okay. First of all, my brother said that the leaders tell them mm that we are the same we are the same community mm. it's not the leaders that tell them mm. we are biologically and uh, naturally the same because the people of kenya and the people of uganda are one people it is the colonial colonial masters and for their convenience, that it shows that we should be nations. Otherwise, we should be a nation. Yeah. And when the colonial masters chose to create a space for their administration, did not consider our ethnicity. That's why if you visit, for instance, the borders uh, of Mount of Mount Eligon region, the 
tribes on the Kenya, what is called the Kenyan side, are the same tribes that are on the Ugandan side. Mm. The cultural leader of the Bagisu stretches up to Kenya. Okay? Mm. The Gisu communities in Kenya bear allegiance to the cultural leader of Bugisu. When you go to uh, places like Maraba, you'll find the Itesot in Kenya are the same Itesot on the side of Uganda. And the Emori Mori, who is the cultural leader of the Itesot, stretches up to Kenya. Mm. He rules more than President M7. Mm. Well, President M7 stops at the border. The Emori Mori comes <laughs> up, to, <laughs> up to Kenya. Yeah. You see this? Mm. When you go to Busia, for instance, at one time you had the Mudra Wari here mm -hmm. as a very prominent leader, and Agra Wari, a biological brother, on the other side in parliament. That means that we are actually the same. Mm. And uh, it's not the leaders who should tell us that, but we should believe and behave as such. We are brothers and sisters. That notwithstanding, without the consultation of our forefathers, the colonial masters, sitting thousands of kilometers away from Africa in Berlin, mm. chose to call us nations. And we, they colonized us as either colonies or protectorates, whatever they whatever they chose to. And uh, because of that uh, colonial subjugation, the Africans had to begin fighting for their independence. And many of the African nations got their independence almost at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Uganda, in 1962, witnessed a historical event of lowering the British colonial flag and hoisting the current Ugandan flag. And it is this that occasioned the celebrations that have been going on, called the Independence Day celebrations. Of course, we value that date, because it is the day when we saw a change of political guards from the whites to the Africans. Mm. And um, we respect, therefore, the fact that um, we were made nations and um, we attained independence at different times. But because we know and remember the historical distortions of colonialism, that's why African leaders are becoming nationalistic all the time, right from our founders, the Mzee Kinyatas, the Nyerere, the Kaundas, the Patrice Lumumba, and others the struggle to decolonize ourselves mm. and become an, an African state continues. Mm. Many leaders, like uh, uh, the great leader of Libya, Gaddafi, had a dream of creating an African state so drastically. Mm. He died without achieving it. Mm. It is a struggle. But one day we shall have to achieve it, as long as we are focused. You see that happening? Yeah. What would it take for that to happen? If, if you just look at the context, the East African community has been heading towards some sort of integration, political monetary integration. It's taken forever. It is not forever. It's, well, it's taken a long time. It is a process. Uh -huh. It is a process. For integration to take place, the mindset 
of the people to be integrated has got to be fine-tuned towards that. Many lead, uh, Africans, unfortunately, because they were born and believe in the nations they have found, think that they are different nations. Mm. But uh, with the time, when Africans appreciate that we are the same, it will, we shall form a federation. Are we heading towards that? The East African community that you are talking about, mm. first of all, it had the turbulence. At one time, it was disbanded. Yeah. Also, because of ideological deficiency by leaders, people who, don't, who, who did not appreciate the importance of integration. And um, so at one time it uh, did not exist. Mm. But now we are sure we are on the right course. For integration, political integration to take place, there must be other factors that must take place. For instance, there must be economic integration. One day when people think about themselves as East Africans and therefore don't need permit, work permit mm. to move from Arusha to come and work in Nairobi, that will be the beginning of integration. Mm. The day people will carry their merchandise across Maraba border without the unnecessary bureaucracy that takes place there, that will be the beginning of integration. The people of Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Southern Sudan, the day they will be able to move and cross borders without being asked for visas, that will be the beginning of integration. And it's a process, and it's beginning. Mm. Mm. It is already beginning to shape. So there's appetite for it. Are we looking at appetite from all the specific governments saying, is that the direction in which governments are, are today when we look at the East African community, Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, saying this is actually the direction we should go? Or uh, is the concentration heavy on nationalism and uh, internal development first? What is happening is um, first of all, as far as Uganda is concerned, the integ integration should have taken place yesterday. Mm. It is not uh, something we look at as a future thing. Mm. But because we cannot force integration, it is a process. We are waiting for other countries to appreciate the importance of integration. And um, What we are sure will eventually happen is when the leaders appreciate that the safest thing for us is to become a bigger nation than what we are, the easier for it will, will it be for integration to take place. Because today when we talk about economies like China. China is becoming a world power economically because of its numbers. Yeah. And as when with us we begin to think about a small population of Kenya, a small population of Uganda, another very tiny population of, of Sudan, Southern Sudan, Northern Sudan, and so on, mm. we are very easy to manipulate. And when we begin thinking about our nations, then we begin protecting our poverty. Mm -hmm. I call it poverty because <laughs> when you say our sugar must remain here, it should not cross this, you are protecting our poverty. At one time, President Museven said, beginning to compare the economies of the African nations, saying, which is better? Is it Uganda or Kenya? Is it Kenya or Tanzania? Is it Tanzania or Rwanda? Mm. It is like a two, two, two dwarfs 
beginning to wonder who is it one than the other. <laughs> because, <laughs> yes, because <laughs> same height. We, we are the same height and we cannot become taller unless we support each other. Yeah. So, uh, your, your president, Bona, uh, Ambassador, has actually been in the forefront, even in reviving the ESC. Yes. And in trying to spearhead this conversation towards integration. Yes. All the things that you've said have actually been put on the table mm. at a political level, at uh, East African Legislative Assembly, at when heads of states uh, meet during their summits, when ministers meet, when ambassadors such as yourselves meet. Talk has happened. What is it, in your opinion, that hinders the, uh, the movement of this towards becoming a reality? What is slowing it down? I think it's a self interest. Whose? The leaders. Mm -hmm. When somebody thinks that he owns a certain territory and if he allows it to go, he will have lost hegemony. <laughs> it is a self interest. But if we appreciate, eh? of course, when we say, let's have the East African territory as one. Mm. Then the next question is, who, who is, is now going, going to be, to be the, the president? president? <laughs> Which is self-interest, yeah. isn't it? Mm. Who is going to own what? Self-interest. But you know, Excellence, even as you say that, huh, anyone who's ever visited a border town, you will find that government bureaucracy aside, the people who live on those borders conduct their business as though they are one entity. Absolutely. In fact, the border is something you talk about, but People go back and forth as though that border doesn't actually exist. Actually, it doesn't exist. Yes. It is a mere administrative expression. Mm. But to the people, it doesn't exist. No, it doesn't. When I go to Uganda mm. by road, for mm. instance, mm. with a government vehicle they see, with mm. a flag, mm. I'll take more time clearing in the offices to cross the border while people are moving from uh, <laughs> this border to the other side and coming back at 10 times their when business. you are still in the queue. <laughs> yeah. With them, the border doesn't exist. Yeah. They are the same community. Yes. It is us in offices who believe that a border exists. But our communities don't believe. Actually, the creation of the border is a burden to the ordinary folk. Mm. Yeah. They, would, they would live happier without it. You know, we see a lot of, um, especially trade taking place. Uh, Uganda is Kenya's biggest export market. There's a lot of, of, of business that takes place between Kenya and Uganda. Kenyan traders just get up in the morning, board a bus, and they, in the evening they're in Uganda. Tomorrow morning they're back with yes. the overnight bus. Yes. Doing business. Same with Ugandans. Mm. And, and if you just look at, at, like you're saying, the reality is the citizens just want to trade. But the governments then come in and they start now introducing some barriers. Yes. So we have said, okay, these are non-tariff barriers. How do we deal with them? We've come up with tariff. We have had an issue, just like you said, of produce. Produce grown, it's doing very well in Uganda. And we need it to come to Kenya, but we can't bring it to Kenya. Why? Because, you know, well, why should milk from Uganda be coming to Kenya? Why should this be crossing over? How can we move away from this? Uh, as far as Uganda is concerned, it has moved away from that a long time ago. Today, if you drove from here and you went into Uganda in a place called Movende, for instance, Movende is after Kampara. Mm. Or if you went to Kiriandongo, Kiriandongo is towards Sudan you will find Kenyan trucks loading maize. Today, mm. you'll find the Kenyan trucks loading maize. And they don't only buy maize in the major centers, but go deep in the villages, and some of them even buy maize before it is harvested. 
You get me? They book it. This is the amount of freedom that we want. Mm. So the Kenyan can go to Uganda without any restrictions, buy maize, bring it to Maraba, and it is brought to for production here mm -hmm. or for storage or for whatever. This is already happening in Uganda. But as you have said, it is the governments that create the barriers and interfere with the normal operations of the ordinary businessman. Mm. So you'll find still personal interests. If I'm uh, somebody in, in, in Uganda and I'm dealing in uh, produce and I fear competition, I will uh, pay the influence and make competition difficult. Yeah. This is what happens. People's interests. Can, can I ask a For question? instance, I'll yes. tell you mm. that at one time there was a story that Uganda maize had been blocked at the border. Yes. Mm. Up to today as we talk, we have never seen any official letter from the government of Uganda blocking the maize. But it was on social media and the trucks were stopped there. This is a so, so it was a rumor. Perso personal <laughs> interests. Somebody can sit down and concoct a story <laughs> and it appears as if it is official. When actually. So when the two governments met, they discovered that nothing has happened of that in nature. <laughs> and the maze has continued to cross up to now. So, personal interests will make the integration a problem. You know, when you talk of integration, uh, Your Excellency, Yes. Uh, first of all, we talk of infrastructure, mm -hmm. road network, Yes. rail network, uh, network by sea. So I want to ask, the Uganda rail network, fully operational, Port Bell, and the sea avenues from which trade could actually be facilitated, are they also fully operational? Um, first of all, I want to congratulate the Republic of Kenya for the railway network that connects from Mombasa. It is uh, quite developed and facilitating trade. Mm. The other side of uh, the Uganda Railway is yet to be modernized to this level, mm. but it exists. Merchandise can move from the border up to Kampala mm. by rail. Mm. The Lake Victoria transport system is on and the trade thrives between Kisumu, Mwanza, Jinja, and Tebe and so on. Very well. The road network, Uganda's road network is very facilitative. It is very good. These days, a trailer can move from Mombasa to Kampala in three, four days. This should take weeks because of the ne road network. Mm. It's very good. The air has greatly improved. Kenya Airways, I think, makes more than 12 routes to, to Uganda every week. Mm. And now Uganda Airlines is flying twice every day to Nairobi and to Mombasa now. Mm -hmm. So that is facilitating trade. And um, I think this is a good gesture. 
if there is more trade that goes on between Uganda and Kenya, it facilitates economic integration, mm. which is a bedrock for political integration. Yeah. We are having a conversation about the relations between Kenya and Uganda, but also Uganda's place in the East African community. You know, your president is the Mze of the region, the Mze of Boma. Yeah. And of course, Uganda has had, you know, far reaching relations with the countries around it. We're talking about like South Sudan, Uganda has participated in peace in South Sudan. Uganda's troops are in Somalia. Yeah, Uganda has done a lot in terms of the region around it, Rwanda, in Burundi, Tanzania, the relations there. Now, if we look at all those things that, you know, Uganda has been, you know, doing around there, what would you say would be the impact of Uganda's influence in East African region? Thank you. First of all, Uganda and President Museven in particular, knows and believes that um, insecurity anywhere can be insecurity everywhere. Mm -hmm. And one of our greatest exports is peace. The Ugandan sons and daughters in the Uganda People's Defense Forces have sacrificed their lives. They have sacrificed their families. They have sacrificed their privileges to live in their country and have gone to live in the bushes of Southern Sudan in Somalia, in the Central African Republic. Mm. Not because Ugandans are expansionists, because all the areas that we have pacified were not annexed to any of the areas on Uganda. Mm. The map of Uganda has remained the same. But because we cherish peace for all of humanity. Mm -hmm. And when there is peace in Sudan, when there is peace in Central Africa, when there is peace in Somalia, we know that in the region there is peace. If you have a bad neighbor, the influence will, will spill over to your compound. Mm -hmm. So the best, if you want to have peace in your compound, create a peace in your neighbor's compound. But sometimes that could also be looked at interfering with your neighbor's affairs. We don't interfere. Uganda doesn't interfere. And in any case, we are always invited. So there is no interference. Mm. If it was interference, then we would be subjugating the areas that we control, we create peace. <laughs> we don't subjugate. Mm. Somalia has held the elections under our supervision. The, the, so yeah. the, so the Somalis exercise their democracy. So, Sometimes it's the African Union, which is appealing. We went to, to Somalia by invitation. Sometimes it's the United Nations. We are a global community, mm. and we respect international global communities like the UN, the African Union, the East African community. If it requests us to contribute troops to the East African peacekeeping force. Mm. We shall respect it because we respect 
the East African community. Okay, I am in agreement with you, and I'd just like to add that <clears throat> in addition to what you say, you see the Pan-African movement that was begun by a Jamaican called Marcus Garvey is actually nestled in Kampala. And the uh, patron, as we currently speak, is actually His Excellency Ayoweri Museveni. Yeah. And the current chairman is Mr. Kahinda Otafil. Otafil, yes. Yes. So, with the Pan-African movement that many people perhaps don't understand or don't think about, mm. but this is the movement that Marcus Garvey thought would bring all black people together. Absolutely. Yes. And uh, one of the biggest supporters of it had been the late uh, Gaddafi. Mm. So my question, even as I look at this, is knowing that the government of Uganda actually supports, physically, financially supports the movement, what has been the response of your neighbors, us, for instance, Tanzania and the others? And Rwanda. And Rwanda and, and, and beyond. Because... If there is support for it, mm. then the oneness that we speak about becomes an even greater reality. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. As I told you, one of the biggest problems that uh, one on his faces is self-interest. You can't avoid it. Self-interest. Mm. And sometimes maybe I want to call it envy. Why is it that he, it is M7 who is successful in the Sudan, in Somalia? Why? Envy. But it also depends on ideological upbringing. As my brother said, President Seven and the, the cadre of leaders of his generation believe in Pan-Africanism, mm. not nationalism. Mm. Actually, on the four principles of the NRM today, the word nationalism has been removed, and instead, it is pan-Africanism. Mm. We are looking at Uganda beyond the boundaries. Not to expand, we are not expansionists. If expanding was our responsibility, mm. Rwanda would be part of Uganda. Juba would be part of Uganda if it was our mission because it's our forces mm. that created the current day Rwanda. Mm. It is our forces that have created Juba. Mm. It is our forces that are now managing Somalia. But we have not called them part of the territory of Uganda mm. because we are looking at a bigger African picture. Mm. Pan-Africanism. That is our mission. I've got a question that's coming in on social media. Raphael is asking, there is the issue of fishing on Lake Victoria, um, the issue around Megingo Island, and the presence of contraband goods coming in from uh, Uganda. What's the ambassador's take on these two problems? One thing that I want to assure my brother who is asking that question is that there is no question between Uganda and Kenya that cannot be solved. And it is a matter of time. Uganda and Kenya will solve all the issues on uh, Lake Victoria. Are there talks this is that are taking place this, on this? Mm -hmm. Are there talks that are already going on to resolve these issues? Many. There are talks at interministerial level and even at the level of the principles, mm -hmm. the President Museveni and President Uhuru discuss all these issues. And before the end of this year, we are having a joint ministerial commission meeting in, in Kampara 
to discuss many issues, including Lake Victoria, including the tariffs, including peace, and many. Several ministers from the Republic of Kenya will come to Kampala mm. and join their counterparts and discuss on how to manage these issues. Mm. The previous meeting was in 2019 and it was in Nairobi. So the second meeting is supposed to be in, in Kampala. Mm. It is the COVID that interfered. It should have taken place already. Mm -hmm. But we have agreed that before the end of the year, there's going to be a joint ministerial meeting to handle most of these issues. Mm. What is important, and everybody listening to us should know, is that Uganda and Kenya are brothers and sisters and they cannot sustain a conflict. Any conflict will be resolved even when it in requires making sacrifices. Mm. I'll give you an example. In April, there was an inter-trade inter meeting between the government of Kenya and the government of Uganda, and it took place in Kampala. Mm -hmm. But um, it culminated into the Minister for Trade of Kenya and the Minister for Uganda leading a delegation of Kenyan delegation and Uganda delegation that are meeting the president. And the issue was to do with the non-tariff barriers. For instance, I'll tell you that uh, Uganda had the uh, non-tariff barriers on uh, furniture from Kenya, okay? On uh, uh, sanitary materials from Kenya and many others. And the meeting was the shortest that I've ever known, bilateral meeting. Mm -hmm. When the president was asked to talk, he said, I have uh, abolished all those non-tariff non barriers. And we clapped and we went out. <laughs> you get me? Yeah. So there is nothing that can make us fail. Mm. And Uganda, Kenya is reciprocating in the same way. Our sugar now comes. We are allowed to bring 90,000 tons of sugar to Kenya today. And if you go to the supermarkets, I, am, I was happy last time. I went to the supermarkets here in Nairobi. And I found the calculated sugar on the stalls. I said, yes, this is the meaning of peace mm. between us. You've talked about the consistency of uh, how Uganda has uh, been in the region, uh, Ambassador. Would you attribute that kind of consistency to the uh, long-serving leadership of President Museveni? Of course, uh President Seven has uh, created peace in Uganda. Everybody enjoys it. And so what else can he do other than exporting it? So he has to export part of it. Since you've done your use. We have enough. We have enough of it. We have enough of it. When you produce in abundance, beyond what you can consume, you export. You share with your neighbor. Yes. Today we are, we are producing more maize than we can eat in Uganda. So we have to bring some here. We are producing more sugar than we can consume in Uganda. So we have to bring some here. We are producing more milk than we can consume in Uganda. So we have to bring some here. Mm. And we have produced more peace than we deserved. So some peace have got to be <laughs> exported. <laughs> so we say extend the peace to Somalia, to <laughs> Southern Sudan, and to any African country that needs peace. Mm. We are ready to export the peace. People always talk about, now you've talked about the surplus in production that you have in your country. Maize, sugar, milk, that means your dairy sector is also thriving. And then when we talk about our production in the country, among the challenges that we find is the cost of production here is very high. 
What has Uganda done to be able to manage that cost of production, make it low, make it uh, easy for farmers in Uganda to produce? Okay, what is her, uh, first of all, the, what I have learned in the short while when I'm here mm. is that uh, Kenyan people are very hardworking people. If there is anything I've learned from Kenya, is to be a hard worker. Mm. And I think I should be a better person. <laughs> because when I see the way people here work, mm. they are not jokers. Mm. They work. But they also work because conditions are not very easy. For instance, here you may not produce the amount of maize you need per acre unless you use fertilizers. Mm. In, in Uganda, you don't need fertilizers to produce the maize you need. Mm. Why is that? The soils are so good compared to our soils here. Mm. When I travel by train, deliberately to see what Kenya is, I see land that requires a lot of motivation to produce. To produce. <laughs> Which is not in... If you cross... Actually, if you go, I deliberately... Sometimes, instead of flying to Entebbe, I fly to Kisumu. And then I drive from Kisumu across the border. And you see the soils from Kisumu towards the other side mm. are different from the soils on this side. The other people also don't require motivating the soil to produce. So, naturally, our cost of production is zero because our soils are fertile. Mm. Then the other thing is, I've lived in Nairobi. Even during a very cold period, like uh, it was in uh, July, there's no rain. There's no rain. Mm. I planted some matok and so on on my compound in Lavington. Mm. And it is a struggle for them to... <laughs> <laughs> to, to struggle to sprout. despite to your sprout. motivation they don't yes. seem to be <laughs> you see this mm. but the same matoka I planted in Imbari at the same time the other ones in two months three months uh, Fruiting. I, I will be harvesting now even the weather seems yeah, I don't blame anybody mm. Mm? the weather also is not favorable very favorable mm. because in uganda if it rains now and it stops in 30 minutes there's going to be sunshine and this is what the plant wants okay mm. here you can stay the whole day without seeing sun <laughs> sunshine what do you expect the crops to do <laughs> yeah? we are now just beginning to enjoy life in Nairobi. Mm. In July, I almost ran away. <laughs> I went to Mombasa so many, so many times to run away from the weather here. <laughs> you needed three, four blankets to survive. <laughs> then I said, this is terrible. The way we feel as human beings, it is the same way the crops feel. Mm. So, as a result, the cost of production mm. of agricultural products in Uganda is lower than here. Than here. Naturally, also. Mm. Nature contributes. Balozi, we thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we can clearly see you're enjoying your tour of duty in this country. Keep coming, and as long as you're here. You're welcome. Um, let's talk a lot more about our relations between Kenya and Uganda, and so sharing those experiences. Yes. His Excellency, Dr. Hassan Waswagaliwango, is... Uganda's High Commissioner to Kenya and the Seychelles. And as you commemorate your 59 years of independence tomorrow, we wish you and the people of Uganda all the best. Thank you. It's good to have uh, you on the show this entire week. And we also want to say thank you to these guys at Sassini who have been kind to us the entire week. Huh? Mm. Some nice, lovely coffee. Thank you. Instant coffee from Sassini. Instant coffee is a fine blend of African coffee made to offer a rich, smooth taste and aroma. Mm. You enjoyed it? I did. My cup is empty. I wish uh, it could uh, again. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll not give you, give you this one. Come on Monday, I'll give you some. Monday will be a public holiday here. I'll give you some more coffee. Mm.
And I will be hanging out together on Sunday at uh, Jiweka Tavern in Nairobi because it's a sports hangout. So we'll have uh, Edward Kwach who will be hosting that entire banter, F1, football and all, sports hangout. And then we'll have DJs Absolute and DJ Bryo will be playing at Jiweka Tavern. We're there, right? Yeah. Ambassador, come to Jiweka. You're welcome. Come to Jiweka on Sunday. Tuta, tuta yeah, yeah, fantastic. Asante. City, let's conclude with the day's proverb. A person who fetched water is most troubled when it is wasted. <laughs> the person who exports peace is more peaceful to another country. <laughs> when he sees that peace being wasted, he's <laughs> <laughs> most troubled. He's <laughs> troubled. You are absolutely right. You have spiced up the independence of uganda Bas. <laughs> thank you spice <laughs> fm thank, thank you very, you much, very much for tuning in to kenya's biggest conversation this week see you again on monday on that day which will be like uh, it will be still another friday for city and i we'll, we'll come back on sunday night we'll be here Enjoy on monday the jacket mm -hmm. exploits. Mm -hmm. we can you can come with us and do really? don't feel left out <laughs>